G'day guys, Dylan Buckley here. Welcome back to Friday Knockoffs, brought to you by our beautiful friends at Pepper Jack. This week on the show, Tegan Higginbotham, one of my old friends actually. We rekindle on our Blues Days together, shooting some content. She's one of Australia's biggest comedians and she's got so much more to talk about. She's actually waiting for me now. I've got to get going. How are you, my friend? Good, how are you? Good, Good to see, to see you. you. Great to see you again. How's your week been? What, how's your week been? Great. It's Me been too. good. Yeah, good. I feel like the weeks are just better in general at the moment because oh. my football club is doing well, so I can be happy again. It is good to do well. Look, when your team isn't sort of holding up the ladder at the bottom, and I know I played for that team as well, if you didn't, if you remember. <laughs> sure we actually haven't met before. Vaguely, vaguely. Vaguely. It's good. Yeah. It's, a, it's a nice life. It's amazing how restorative Carlton's efforts have been this year. Actually, I took my dad to the first game, you know, the season opener against Richmond. It was his 60th birthday, so we're like, look, we've got to go to the game. We'll make a night of it. And in the second uh, quarter, you know, we had a really good second quarter, and I turned to dad and I was like, this is enough. Look, if we're here and this is all we got, at least we got to see a really good second quarter and we should be grateful for that dad. And we're like already talking ourselves into the loss. Also, I knew that I had to take him home that night and I had a three hour drive ahead oh, of no. me, which I'd braced myself for a horrible drive. But then in the fourth quarter, we realized that we were winning. I got teary, he got teary. We're just so happy and that happiness hasn't stopped. That's beautiful because we met, I think, probably like five years ago now. It was we a met little at, while, yeah. Yeah, five or six years ago we met a Carlton thing. And normally when like a lot of big celebrity comedian Carlton supporters come down, <laughs> you never know if they're actually fans. But to hear that, you're actually... You're I a, love him. You're a full nuffy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I yeah. really am. So much so that I am... Um, oh, God, am I allowed to say this? Oh, no, you didn't have posters of me on your wall, did you? No, but okay. I can if you want. <laughs> <laughs> I um, No, I had to back away a little bit during lockdown because... Lockdown was hard enough, and I think I really had to control what I allowed into my small space, which was my lounge room where mm. I lived for six months. And riding the highs and lows with Carlton during that time, I couldn't do it. Wow. And I think that makes me a bad fan, because now they're winning, I'm like, oh, I'm back. But I, it would emotionally ruin me so much that in the end my husband went, this has to stop. Yeah. You can't keep doing this. I can understand that. I really can. And as I said, I'm not talking about my playing career too much, but when you play and you're at a club, you really think, geez, you know, why are people caring so much about this? We're actually trying as hard as we can. Yeah. Now I'm on the other side of the fence. You can actually... Oh, I've lost that already, and I've got now that fan mentality going, come on, boys, like, what the hell is that? Yeah. Effect? Like, you've really got to try harder. So it's, there's a balance of trying to find both. It's funny that you say that, because, I mean, yeah, they do. The other day, my dad was foolishly eating during the Hawthorne match where Carlton... By the way, I love this year that Carlton are doing better, but they still have this incredible gist of riddling us with anxiety yeah. every time they play. Mm. What a magical trick that yeah. is. Um, but he was, almost, he was almost sick because he was so tense. But it was one of our great culture, uh, coaches, one of the many, many, many that we've had, Brendan Bolton, who he used to bang on and on and on about equilibrium. I love this. This is actually, cha like, well, this I is amazing. I love this. I, I remember at the time, you know, of course he was talking about it during the games. If you win or you lose, you have your high moment, you have your low moment. It's but then never as good as you think, never as bad as you think. Right, you've got to come back. And I actually took that as a bit of a life motto at that time after <laughs> gigs because I was doing stand-up at the time and I, it, the, the gigs would define me. If I'd had a good week, I was the king of the world and would do anything. But if I'd had a bad week, I was very depressed, so I was, I was like, go with what Bolt said, equilibrium. It's so, Tegan, this is incredible, this is can't, because I loved Bolt, like he was actually the, the coach that sacked me in the end. Oh, I was just gonna say I loved him too. Yeah, that no, no, awkward. no, we've got, a, it's, <laughs> we've got a really strange relationship because what he, you know, he's like very like hard on me, gave me all these Bolt, like bits of wisdom that I still use to this day, mm. but in saying that he sort of into my career, but I love him the most for doing that. So it's quite weird, but that that equilibrium um, quote, I th literally think about it all the time. It's you're never going as good as you think, you're never going as bad as you think. Don't get too high, don't get too low, stay in the middle. Do you still have chats with him? I do. I still speak to him all wow. Like, you know, we still text. Like when I got picked up at the Giants, he was the first bloke to message me when he left Carlton. I gave him a call, messaged him, and, and just said how much I, you know, love and respect his, you know, everything about him. He went to Hawthorne, when he went to Collingwood, I called him. Like, he's a, he's a great guy, really great you're guy. A bigger person than I am. No, no, he, <laughs> he taught me a lot. He taught me a lot. Yeah. Speaking of that, when I wasn't as good of a uh, bigger person, there were some bitter days and I used to get attacked in the, the Facebook groups a fair bit, you know, drop yeah. him, drop him. Okay. Honestly, 
what did you think of me when you, I can tell you're a harsh supporter. What did you think of when I was playing? Honestly? Honestly. Okay. There are a couple of layers. <laughs> oh, okay. God. No, oh, no. The I first not. layer is that I was so delighted by how much you looked like Frodo Baggins <laughs> that every time you're on the field, I was like, he's here. He's back. <laughs> My little woodland elf is playing football again. Hurrah. Oh, no. Um, no, I, lo I honestly, I, I, I feel like I have memories of you having very good games. Mm. I, I enjoyed it when you got a game. Yeah. It's actually, to be honest, that's the best part is I got enough games for people to like me and that I tried hard, but always oh. got dropped pretty quickly. Fair enough too. But then people thought I was hard done by. So I'm sort of in a very good spot at the moment. It, th it, was, it worked well. You know, you fall in love with the players. Of course, if they can run out and win you a game, you love them regardless. Mm. But I think it is the personalities that you, that you truly fall in love with. And you had a personality, Hopefully. and I think people loved you for that. We got to meet each other off field too. We spent some yes. fun times together, which was good. Speaking of performing on the big stage, mm. okay, we've both done that. Yes. Performing, nonetheless, it might Your be a bit different. Your stage is a bit bigger. Yeah. But... Well, no, I would say <laughs> I probably didn't perform as well as you. I've bombed on the big stage before. Yeah. Okay. Three touches on the MCG once on a Thursday night against Richmond, nearly the biggest game of the year. It was really hard. Okay. Your career, you've done it all. One of Australia's biggest and best comedians. That's very kind of you to Talk say. Talk us through some of your biggest moments on stage. Did you rise to the occasion or has there been times where it well, felt flat? you know, it was, it's been a mixture. This, another incredible Australian comedian, Dave Thornton, actually, he was describing comedy festivals and he said it's something like a game of thirds. Like a third of them are going to be great, a third of them are going to be terrible and then a third of them are just going to be gigs. You know, that's what they're going to be. Mm. And I feel like for me that was my career. I had some absolute corkers where I just smashed it. I had some pretty rough gigs too. There was one, it was always the football clubs that were the real killers, you know. Me being the person that I am stepping on stage at a football club, that never went quite well. <laughs> uh, but there was this one, we were actually, I was performing at a ladies lunch at a football club and this woman threw underwear at me. I. And to this day, I still can't figure out if she was heckling or flirting. I don't know what it was. Oh my God. But there were weird things like that. I. I had another gig in St Kilda. This gig was in this small bar down an alleyway in St Kilda. So already I'm painting a really great picture. Mm. And during this gig, somebody outside the door set a mattress on fire. And I remember as we were all leaving the gig, just wondering whether this was the future my parents really pictured <laughs> when I told them that I was going into the arts. Like, there were weird gigs, but, you know, it's... It, 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 was a, it was a career of highs and lows. I tried to find equilibrium. But the funny thing is, I'm actually not doing stand-up anymore. Is that, is that a Friday knockoff exclusive? I don't know. I don't, maybe, I wow. guess. I, um, it was what it, funny. Yeah, what's, where, what led to this decision? Lockdown, I think, mm. was one of the big contributors. You know, lockdown gave us all a chance to, to settle and figure out the things that we wanted in our life and the things that we missed. And... Uh, and during that time, I, I really came to the decision that I, I didn't miss stand-up. But th I think the thing that, yeah, I remember one night stuck out in particular, and it wasn't that the gig was bad. I was standing backstage and I was on the, sharing the bill with two comedians, uh, Tom Gleeson and mm -hmm. Dilruk J. Sinner. And they were backstage talking about just how much they love stand-up, how much they love writing material, trialling material, the whole shebang. And I was just listening to them going, wow, I don't feel that way mm. at all. I want to go home and hang out with my fiancé. I'm, I'm sick of being in pubs, you know, and, and hanging around and getting paid in drink cards. Like, I, I, I don't love it. And I think I'd hit this plateau with my stand-up where if I really wanted to get better, I needed to go back to basics and start gigging every night and really throw myself into it again. And I just went, yeah, I don't, I don't have that in me, but I also don't want to be the comedian who's kind of good. So... Mm. Yeah, that really started hearing how they loved it. And I'm sure it's the same for sport. I mean, you've got to love it. Oh, it's so... Like, that was eerily similar to the end of my career. Like, yeah, I, right. I seriously remember, you know, being on an AFL list, albeit a rookie, and, and the exact thing. I was like, if I want to make the most of this, I've got to train so much harder and dedicate my life to it. Mm. But also, in a way, felt this, like, overwhelming guilt, being like any young bloke or girl in the country would give their, you know anything to be where I am right now but I just didn't want to be there yeah. as much as anyone else and it was it was tough it, you, you do I, I felt like that as well and I was like maybe this isn't 
the thing for me, I didn't have to quit, I got delisted. But um, <laughs> it was, you know, the decision was made for me. Yeah, and yeah. It, I always remember thinking in that last contract, this could be really bad because if they offer me a new one, I don't know if I'm going to be strong enough to say no. But, oh, yeah. Um, well, yeah, it, it turned out, you know, very fortuitous that I didn't, didn't have to. I watched your episode uh, a little while ago when you had Bette Goddard on mm. and you said something really interesting to her that I... I hope I can ask you about, yeah. which is you'd said that if you'd had a coach like her, maybe you would have played for longer. Mm. And that, at the time, I thought, man, that sounds like there may be regrets there. I think there's... Um, I don't have any regrets. Mm. I don't have any regrets about my footy career at all because I feel like I've actioned them in the second phase of my life. Yeah, OK. If I'd made the same mistakes, I would have definitely felt that. But yeah. I think what I meant more about Beck was the fact that she was so approachable, she was such an awesome, genuine person. Mm. And for some reason, I never had good relationships with coaches. And I can have a relationship with anyone. Yeah. But for some reason, I just had massive anxiety about having a relationship with coaches. Like, what are they thinking? Do they like me? Do they hate me? Do they not rate me? All these sorts of things. So I just overcomplicated it way too much. Yeah. Um, which I love about Beck because I was just sitting there going, oh, I could literally talk to you all day. How interesting. Yeah. And I guess I understand why you would have had problems. Not problems, yeah. but it's difficult with a coach. I mean, they're literally deciding your, your fate. fate. So, mm. you know, how do you just be like, hey, buddy. Yeah. You know, it my is. future's in your hands. And I tried that. It didn't go too well. Yeah, it didn't go too well. Oh, my gosh. What's plans for you now? What do you want to look to? What's your goals? What's exciting? Because you were doing a lot of good work with the AFL, your kai footy, dominating the airways at the moment. Yeah, well, this is a new thing for me. So mm. I've been pulled into this incredible role behind the scenes at Yokai footy. And it's it's such a great job. Do you like I, being behind the, the scenes instead of being on the stage? Like, I, is it is it cool? Is it a different thing? I'm I'm really enjoying it. Yeah. I mean, I like this too. I get the chance to yes. dress up. Yes. Someone who did my makeup. Yeah, it's all very fun too. and fancy. You're me looking too. beautiful. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but no, it is it is incredible. And on a show like Yokai Footy, I mean, I don't think I'm the only person in Australia to say that I do not know enough about the indigenous people mm. in this country. And Yokai is both an incredible creative challenge, but every week it is just learning. And I get to share time with Andy Cracker and Megan Waters, the two incredible hosts from Yokai, and they are incredible. Um, the incredible executive producer, Carla Hart, she's just every week just more information. And it's, yeah, it's been, it's been hugely challenging, but I consider it a privilege, actually. It's one of those jobs that when it came through and I actually got it, I went... Oh, wow. I yeah. was not expecting that, but this is great. No, it's absolutely huge. Uh, Yokai Footy doing tremendous things, as we yeah. know. And Yeah, you're, you're so right. They're doing awesome stuff. Pepper Jack, yeah. all about character, and you have plenty of that. So I'm going to ask you a question today, if you don't mind. Go for it. Do you have a mentor, and what characteristics do they exemplify that you admire? I don't have a specific mentor, okay. but I've worked with a few people, I think particularly in that hosting, presenting role, where I've really been able to just watch them and I've taken a lot from what they do. And um, one of them is really obvious, just because of course he's great, it's Rove. I just, I love watching him work and I love seeing the way he is so professional on screen and so, so funny and so quick, he's so quick. But behind the scenes as well, he's so kind to everybody. If there's a live studio audience, he's kind to the audience. Like he's just, he's one of those top blokes and I, yeah, I really love being around him. Another person who I had the privilege to work with who greatly affected me was Nicole Livingston, actually. Mm. And that was back pre her being the boss of women's really? football. Yeah, we did this show on ABC called Sideliners and I got to work with her each week on live television and she's just another person who is very smart and very fast. And I remember specifically one night, because we all worked off of a teleprompter, the teleprompter just froze mid-show. And watching it back, you would never know because she just kept on rolling and across everything. Just, I don't know how she finds all the time in the day to be so uh, informed about every single sport on the face of the earth, but she finds that time. And then the other person was Jason Dunstall, yeah. who I worked with on The Bounce, and he's just another person. I, you, there's a pattern, really kind, but so smart. Yeah. And he would just churn that show out every Sunday. For him, no teleprompters, he'd just have his clipboard and I just really admired their work ethic and how sharp they were and how good at their craft they were. And I think 
I, especially when I come into the football space, I guess I have a lot of that imposter syndrome because most of the people have played the game mm. and I'm only a fan. I'm a tragic fan who watches games and gets sick when we're losing. Like that's So sometimes I, I would freak out that I really didn't belong in the space. But people like Nick and Jason, they, they always made me feel very welcome as well, which was really nice. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, it's incredible. The one person that stood out then that I was actually thinking about just the other day was Rove. Yeah. Now, as a kid growing up in the 90s, watching Rove was literally the highlight of my week. Yeah. And I actually ran into Ryan Shelton the other day. Oh, Ryan, he's Every, lovely. Lovely, one of the most beautiful guys ever. And we're talking about this with, with the boys and girls in the studio after, we're saying, what about Rove, you think about it? All the other people that have like created careers from that show as well, like yeah. that have come through with him. There's Carrie Bickmore, Ryan Shelton, Hamish and Andy. Yeah. Uh, Peter Hallier. Yeah. Like it, it's literally, it was like a breeding ground of like the next generation of talent in TV. He but has. It, that shows off him that he was so good to bring those people to, because you can probably try and, you know, not, uh, when you're the star of the show, not try and include others a lot. Yeah, and I think I've worked with people who, you know, that's their process, not judging, absolutely judging. Judging. <laughs> we are judging. They will go into their space and it's a very closed door sort of feeling, but you do get the impression with Rove that he is happy to just keep dragging people up and I yeah. think that he'll keep doing that as well. How cool. Yeah. Podcasting world, you're dominating yeah. at the moment, especially your husband and his father-in-law, yeah. loose units. I did not know that was uh, was your husband. That is... That is awesome. Such a good podcast. Quickly give us a quick wrap on that one. And where else are you, are you looking to get to in the podcast world? So Loose Units, I'm so very fortunate to get to help produce that show. My husband, uh, he's an author called Paul Verhoeven and his dad was a cop in Sydney in the 1980s where it was just the wild west of policing. Yes. Anything went. They were racist, they were sexist. All the isms were right there and they... Um, and John now speaks really openly about that in this true crime podcast where he details his time through. He was a uniform officer, then he went into forensics and he's also been a, um, a fireman. Like He's just done all the crazy stuff. But he speaks really openly and honestly, I think, about what was good about the job but also what was really wrong with it and really wrong with policing still today as well. So it's... It's great, but, you know, as the name would give away, they're both a bit loose yeah. and John is a odd, wonderful unit and hearing what he says every week, we just, every time I listen back, I'm going, oh, God, oh, God, what's he said? But it's, it's really good fun. Yeah, really good fun. And your own stars in that, what's your sort of goals in the podcasting world? Can we experience a, a little well, podcast coming soon yourself? Yeah, I've, I do a food co podcast with Paul as well that's really itty-bitty. Food podcast? Yeah. What are you talking there? Well, it's, um, it's called Dish Island and we got approached during lockdown yeah. where all I had to look forward to in my day was eating things and somebody said, do you want to do a podcast about food? I went, yes. So this it's like is a food, right. food reviewing? What it is, it's called Dish Island and mm. every week we welcome a guest onto our Dish Island and they have to tell us what their desert island dish is. So oh, the I one dish yeah, that okay. they would eat for the rest of eternity. And, uh, you know, along that way, we always end up having these really deep conversations because when you think about food, it's it's about family, it's about our relationships. It's Where'd about you get the recipe from, all these types All that of sort things. of stuff. So we, it always starts as just this really fun podcast about food, but my goodness, the conversations we've had. And also, you know, food for some people, it's a really complicated thing. We've had some pretty deep chats about people's relationships with their bodies and, and how food plays into that. So. It's a really great, fun show. Do you know what your desert island dish would be? Oh, I'm just thinking so it now as you now. say it. That's great. Why I'm, do I feel like you're a palmer guy? I'm not a palmer guy. Oh. I'm, a, I'm a flexitarian, as I was telling you before, That's pescatarian. Right. But I would go, honestly, my favourite food would have to be like a veggie lasagna. Really? And I know I can go deep and tell you why. Yeah, 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 do. Well, I don't know how much longer we've got. But we have, when I first like, moved to Sydney, we, there was, we found this pub and it was called the Unicorn Hotel, and they had the best veggie lasagna in the world. So whenever I eat it, I think back to like moving out of Melbourne, growing up, all these like experiences around that. So you might have to get me on the podcast. That's lovely. We'll, we'll go yeah. into it from there. I'll have a chat with you. What's your Friday night footy feed? Mmm. What's in the footy eating? What are you eating? Can I tell you what I'm, I've got planned for this one? You can, okay. please. <laughs> so I've been going all out lately. I'm doing a Sichuan shoulder of lamb wow. with homemade flatbreads, a little bit of a cucumber salad that's got a nice little Asian dressing on it. I'm going all out. And this is, I did it a couple of weeks back for a fancy dinner party and was so impressed with myself that I went, I have to try that again, but in a situation where I don't need to share with guests. Unbelievable. Yeah. Love it. You know what goes with Sichuan lamb? Go on. Pepper Jack. 
Oh, that is so I've got you one of these for coming on. Thank you so much for thank your time. You. Great to catch up. That's a rare find. There you go. Oh, thank you so much. Absolutely I will tasty. enjoy this. Enjoy that tonight and uh, enjoy the game. Thank you.